Well, looks like it's time to start. Hello, everybody. Um, before I get into the lecture, I just want to talk a little bit about course logistics between now and the end of the semester. Um, as you know, I put out uh, a poll to see people's preferences regarding the uh, final exam. And um, my idea was if, if we could give you the exam on the last day of class instead of during the final exam slot, then that would give you a chance to see your final grade before the deadline for deciding between pass, no pass, or letter grade. I thought that might be important to some people, and it looks like it is. Um, the poll was supposed to close today at noon. I, I left it open, but um, it looks like there's uh, most of the people are in favor of holding the exam during um, on the 30th, which would be next Thursday, a week from this coming Thursday, the last day of class. We would hold it in the evening uh, seven to ten. So that's currently the plan that we're going to do. Um, I will give you more information about the content of the exam. The exam will be comprehensive, but it will there'll be more uh, content related to the second half of the semester since uh, we haven't had an exam on that yet. Um, but I'll give you more details on the exam on Tuesday uh, next week, a week from today, which will be a review session. And then the last um, day of class, next Thursday, the 30th, we won't actually have a, a lecture in this time slot. We'll just uh, skip it for that week and then we'll um, move right into the final exam in the evening, which will be you know, the same style that we had for the, for the midterm exam, as far as being a take home exam. So since we don't really have any other option now. Um, so the way it's gonna work now is uh, we're gonna have, we'll have the lecture today which I'll finish up um, this section on multipliers and shifters and other blocks. And then um, on Thursday, uh, we'll have the final lecture and that will be picking up when I'm gonna start today, which will be clock and power distribution. And then um, I think a little bit on faults and um, error codes. And then next Thursday, uh, Tuesday, as I mentioned, will be a review and then next Thursday, there'll be no lecture and the exam will be in the evening, okay? So if you have any questions about that, let me know, but there'll be more information coming um, soon. Okay, so with that, I think I'm gonna get back into the lecture where we left off when I last saw you. We were on this lecture 18, which is multiplier circuits, counters, and shifters. We finished up the multipliers and we started looking at shifter circuits. So the idea of this, this set of lectures here, this along with the adders is, we're looking at the internal details of some of the blocks that are popular blocks in digital design. And as I said previously, a lot of these are synthesized for you automatically, but it's still good to know how they're made and what the trade-offs are making these blocks. So, let's scroll down here. So we were somewhere around here. So uh, last time we looked at this uh, shifter, which is a, a, a one way to build a, a variable shifter, which means uh, we have an input X here, it's 8-bit input, and in this example, it's a 8-bit output, and we can shift um, X by any, in fact, in this case, it's a rotator. It, it shifts and also rotates around. Uh, it'll shift by any amount up to 8 bits, and so there's a three bit control, this S control that uh, adjusts the amount of the, sh the shifting. And the way we implement that is by using uh, three, in this case, three rows of uh, two input multiplexers, which are wired up appropriately so that each stage can do a power of two shift amount. So shift by one or shift by two or shift by three in this case, N over, uh, sorry, four, N over two in this case. Okay, so, so you can extend this idea with other powers of two and other layers. So you end up with log base two number of layers for n bit inputs. Okay, so after that, we kind of said, um, I, I started showing you how this maps onto real hardware. So if you have an ASIC, obviously you have two input multiplexers available. So you might build it exactly as shown in the last slide. Um, in the case of, of of uh, FPGAs, we have LUTs, we don't actually have gates. So, and in modern FPGAs, uh, 
uh, they're not three LUTs anymore, they're bigger LUTs. So if you had three LUTs, a three LUT is a natural way to make a two to one multiplexer. Two to one multiplexer is three inputs, right? Two data inputs and one control input. So it maps nicely and efficiently to a three LUT. But these days, FPGAs have LUTs that are bigger, have more inputs. Uh, Vertex 6 and beyond has six LUTs. That's a natural LUT size for making four to one multiplexers. As I've shown here, there's two control bits and four inputs. That's six total bits. So that maps nicely into a single LUT. So if we want to do one of these shifters in an FPGA, let's say, uh, you probably want to find a way to use these, these six LUTs. So we could reformulate the shifter so it uses four to one multiplexers instead of two to mul one multiplexers. And the way to do that is to group together some of these stages. And that's kind of what I'm showing, oops, showing here. So kind of group those two stages and those two stages. So if you look at the function of those two stages, it either, this as a composite either shifts by zero, shifts by one, or shifts by two, or shifts by three, right? Those are all the possibilities of these two cells. This one can either shift by zero, shift by four, shift by eight, or shift by 12, right? So we can do that by wiring, uh, taking the same principle that I used on the previous slide and wiring up four, uh, uh, four input multiplexers in order to uh, achieve um, these functions for the two blocks and cascade them this way. The final stage in this example would be just a, either shift by zero or shift by 16. That could be, that would need to have a two to one multiplexer in, in order to implement that. And it turns out there are two to one multiplexers, not so many of them, but some are available on FPGAs in the, the so-called F7 mux. And you can look back at the notes and see what that is if you're interested. Okay. So the, the idea is that this kind of shifter works with two to one muxes, it works with other size muxes as well. It's the same basic principle. Okay, so let's look at another idea for shifting. Let's say, could we improve this by actually getting less delay, less logic delay perhaps? So here's an approach. So what I did here is I associate with each output, the outputs are Y, the inputs are X over here on the right, uh, each output has its own dedicated multiplexer that can choose from where to get its output bit, right? So if we wanted to just send the data straight through without shifting, we could set S here to zero, and each multiplexer would just choose its zeroth input. So Y would come from X zero, and Y zero would come from X zero, Y one would come from X one, Y two would come from X two, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then if we wanted to shift, we make, let's say we shift, want to shift by one, we set X to S to one, then Y zero would come from uh, X seven, right? And Y one would come from, uh, from, z from uh, X zero. So this would be a shift to one place to the right uh, or one place to the left with a rotate, meaning that the top bit would come all the way right down and, and, and around into, um, Y zero. Okay, so then we could get any shift amount by this. So it looks like this might be an improvement because instead of having three layers of multiplexers, we only have one layer of multiplexer between each input and each output. Uh, the problem perhaps is that the delay, there may be a big delay in these big muxes, right? Uh, as you could, in fact, there is. Um, however, if we think about implementing it at the transistor level, remember when we were looking at multiplexers, we we looked at circuits that could affix, efficiently do, do muxing by using uh, transmission gates. So we can do something like that. And it's kind of an interesting design if we do that. It looks like this. And this is what people call a barrel shifter. And the way to look at this is inputs coming here on the top in these columns and outputs come over here on the right on these rows. And then we've got these buffer here just for electrical isolation from other circuits. And then at each cross point, everywhere where X meets the Y's, we have a transmission gate shown over here. The control signals that control the transmission gates are in these dashed lines. And the way this thing gets wired up, there's a decoder here. So the shift amount comes in and the decoder turns it into a one hat code. And for each shift, unique shift amount, one of these control lines is activated. Right? just like any good uh, decoder. 
So if we put shift amount of zero in, you can see we activate the diagonal here. And what the diagonal does is connect x0 to x1, x1 to x1, uh, x1 to y1, x2 to y2, x3 to y3, et cetera, et cetera. If we put a different shift amount in, let's say put shift amount of one in, it would activate this off diagonal here. And you can see what that would do is turn on that transmission gate. So x0 would go out on x1, and x1 would go out on uh, y2, and x, uh, x2 would go out on y3, et cetera, et cetera, and we will have achieved its shift. In fact, we can get any shift amount by activating whatever diagonal that we want in this device. So it's a it's nice, easy way to see how the shifter works. And then these, these control signals wrap around so we can do a, a rotation as well. So um, this is an interesting way to do a shift. It relies on being able to build circuits at the trans, uh, transistor level. Uh, so we can ask the question, what's the cost and delay of this and how does it compare to our previous um, shifter strategy? And um, well, the delay is gonna go proportional with N squared, right? Because as we increase N, the number of columns and the number of rows both increase. So that would be an N squared increase in area on a chip and with number of transistors. But it is a fairly compact cell because there's not much logic inside, there's really just two transistors for these transmission gates. So it grows with N squared, but it's still a fairly compact structure. As far as the delay, well, um, the logic delay is very short because there's not much, there's, you know, you could count the delay of those two buffers maybe. And in fact, it kind of looks like the logic delay is independent of the, of N. The real issue with this design is there's a electrical delay. As you increase N, you're gonna have more rows. That means there's more of these transmission gates connected onto this wire. So the capacitance of that wire due to the extra uh, connections and also due to the extra length, capacitance of that wire will grow with N. Likewise, on this wire will grow with N. So the uh, delay kind of goes grows with uh, with N. Uh, there's also a uh, delay associated with the decoder. Okay, so, but that's a, it's a nice uh, way to build a shifter. So, um, and, and in fact, the structure can be used for more than just shifting. Let me show you here. So if you just look at this connection matrix here, so we have the X inputs that come down here on the columns and then the Y outputs that come down here, out here on the, on the, y, on the rows. And at each cross point, we put a, a switch, a transmission gate, which could either make that connection or it can stay open, in which case there's no connection. Um, some ways it's similar to what we saw inside an FPGA for interconnection uh, network. And in fact, this is kind of a way to do interconnections in a very general way. Uh, if, if you look at it here, there's N squared control points, the way I've drawn it here, because every transmission gate could be in this configuration, every transmission gate could be controlled independently. So we can ask the question, what other interesting functions could this structure do besides shifting? I already showed you how to do shifting. You put a single decoder down here and connect the control signals and diagonals. But you know, if you look at, like for instance, uh, take this uh, Y input here, we could connect it to every output, right? So we could broadcast this X to every output if we wanted to. Or we could choose to send this Y to every output. Or we could choose to send X to a few of the outputs and then maybe uh, X1 to a few of the other outputs. Right? Or we could just wrote, we could reverse all the bits of X. Right? So it can do any permutation of, um, of uh, X into Y. Right? So it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing. Now, it's actually overly general as I've shown it here because there's some cases that we never really care about. For instance, we would never connect more than one X to a single output, right? That would not be a proper permutation. So we can do all useful permutations by putting a decoder for each row here. Because what the decoder for each row says is that only one of these transmission gates will be activated for each row. 
and that will choose from where its uh, associated output will get its input. Right? So it can do um, all permutations, any one-to-one -one and one-to-many connections with this structure. And we, we need all these decoders to do it because we want independent control over each output. Right? So this takes n log n control signals to do it. Um, this is a common structure that gets used in communication hardware in switches and heart and routers is you have some let's say uh, the kind of switch that is used for internet traffic you have some set of connections that comes in on, on the x's and they have to go out to different places right so this is a way that the routing through the network can happen is through a switch like this so chips that implement this type of cross we call a crossbar switch uh, are used for uh, are often implemented this way and are used for uh, communication switching and routing. Okay, so that's this kind of a uh, little diversion of where kind of the, 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 the design behind a, a shifter can be used for more general functions. And in this case, it's, a, it's an important thing called a crossbar switch. Okay, so that was uh, all I wanted to say about shifters. Um, I want to talk a bit about counters. We've Talked about counters earlier in the semester when we introduced uh, our standard flip flops, and I showed uh, flip flops and registers, and I showed some examples in Verilog of how to make counters um, out of registers. I, I want to talk now about what is actually inside a counter. If you're going to count, if you're going to um, optimize the circuitry of a counter, and so a little background first. So counters are special sequential circuits are really f uh, finite state machines they rep they repeatedly sequence through a set of outputs okay we've we're most com most familiar with binary counters we've looked at those earlier these are uh, state machines just kind of count in a binary way like here's a, a three-bit version and it counts all the way up from zero 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 to one 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 and then it repeats it just wraps around typically now there's also gray counters we've talked about gray code um, in the past, and this is a you know a sequence that might be the output of a circuit that is a gray code counter. And then there's one hot counters that kind of just move a bit through. <laughs> the bit is here, and then it moves to there, then it moves to there, then it moves to here. Right? Some people call that a ring counter. Uh, there's binary coded decimal counters where we just count through the the decimal digits. Uh, there's also pseudo-random sequence generators that just gen count through a fixed net set of patterns, but count, move through that those patterns in a random way, or in a pseudo-random way. Okay. Um, so what counters, all of them really can be described as uh, more finite state machines with a ring structure, right? A ring structure meaning it kind of just repeats through a set of, of states, and, and the number of states is depends on the width of the counter, right? So that means we could, um, well, let me just say a little more first. So what are they used for? Um, counters are kind of an important element in digital design. They're, they're um, common because as I mentioned earlier, um, iteration, all our computations involve some, uh, some iteration or looping and so, uh, for instance, shift and add multiply schemes that we talked about last time, or or bit serial communication circuits that need to count through a width's worth of, of serial bits. Right? So all these involve some kind of looping, and therefore counters are helpful for building control in order to keep track of the loops. Um, they're also used um, for as clock dividers. So if we have a high frequency signal in and we want to turn it into a low frequency signal, like for a clock purposes of clock, we can do a divide by uh, some amount, right? And we can use that, we can use a counter for that. Um, and as I said, counters often simplify the control controller design. Uh, if there's a specific, providing some specific number of cycles of action, it's often more efficient to do that with a uh, with a counter coupled along with an FPGA, uh, with a uh, FSM rather than just using FSM by itself, it will reduce the number of states in the FSM. Right? So for instance, here's an example of this uh, bit serial multiplier that I showed you the other day, and it takes n squared cycles to compute um, 
one result, uh, n by n result. And uh, remember, one bit of the result is, is uh, calculated at n cycles. And here is the control algorithm down here, and it's specified as uh, nested loops. So the first loop, the internal loop counts to n, and then the outer loop increments one, and then the inner loop counts to n again, and the outer loop increments, okay, and that whole process happens until the outer loop increments all the way to n. And at that point, we'll have achieved n squared cycles. So you can imagine that building the, con the finite state machine for this, if we're gonna build it in the kind of a traditional method, we'd have n squared states because it takes n squared cycles to complete an operation on this data path. And that would be a big finite state machine, lots of states um, to keep track of. And uh, so we can kind of simplify that design by having a counter that keeps track of these inner cycles and a counter that keeps track of the outer cycles and then a finite state machine that kind of triggers and takes 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 a, a output from the counters and provides triggering to the counters that control when they count. Right. So I'm going to show you that um, briefly without going into a lot, de a lot of details. So we could have a finite state machine that looks like this. There's the idle state um, waiting to start once we start. We go into a state which says we're in the inner loop and then use a, a counter here. This, what this would do is trigger the counter, a clock enable the counter. Counter would then start clock accounting. And it were, when it was done, there would be a signal from the counter, a terminal count signal, which I believe we talked about previously that says we've count to the, counted to the maximum value. So when we get to the terminal count, we go to this outer node. And what the outer node does is an enable another counter, the outer counter for one cycle to increment itself. And then we'll go back to the inner and go around this n times and then back to the outer. Okay, so you can see the finite state machine controller for the circuit is much simplified now because of the use of counters. And the counters do the keep track of the iterations for us. And then when the, when the outer loop counter gets to TC, terminal count is true, then we're done, we can go back to the idle state. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so that was kind of motivate why, one, one reason why we like why we like to use counters. And then you can see that just for your, so you can see all the details. I showed the detail of the finite state machine control controller here. I did a one hot encoding and then here are all the control signals. Okay. So <clears throat> how do we design counters and how do we actually build counters? Well, um, this is kind of what you've seen previously for binary counters. The most common case is, is uh, just the most common case counter is a binary counter. And for that, we would do that. Uh, we would build that by using uh, a simple incrementer, right? Which is just um, a uh, plus one in a register. Excuse me for a second. Uh, and this is kind of what we did in Verilog. We can, uh, you could do in Verilog. Now, what we had done earlier is we instantiate the plus one in, in the uh, register explicitly. Um, and so you kind of get an assignment that says X gets uh, X plus one. Uh, the, I think the way we did it was we would said that next state is equal to present state plus one. But it's effectively the same thing. So if you were to do this, you wouldn't necessarily get an adder here because um, uh, adding by one is simpler than just general adder, okay? You get something that's simpler. Um, so we're gonna look at the circuit for that, not necessarily for an incrementer, but for a counter. Um, in general, the best way to understand a counter design is to think of it as an FSM, and then we can follow the general procedure. However, there's some special cases that can be optimized, as, as we will see. So let's look at a, a synchronous counter here, a binary counter. So I'm kind of taking, thinking of it like a finite state machine where um, it's a three-bit version here. So we can specify the truth table that says, if the three bits of the counter are A, B, and C, okay, and if the counter is currently at state 0, 0, 0, the next state, which is uh, A plus, B plus, and C plus, 
it's going to be one zero zero right we just increment it by one if we're in this state we go to there in this state we go to here if we're in the one 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 state we go to um, all zeros that's where it wraps around okay so if we we know from earlier in the semester if if we have a truth table like this right we know how to design a circuit that can implement this we can figure out what the next state logic is based on the present state. Right. So that's kind of what I did here on the right, and uh, you could do Carnot maps or something, but I just did it algebraically because it's pretty simple in this in this three-bit binary counter case. You can see that A plus is just A bar, right? So on everywhere, all we do is to get the new A, we just increment the, the old A, I mean, uh, um, invert the old A. And then B here, you can see from this pattern, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Um, that's XOR of the B, of A and B, right? If you ignore C for now and just look at A and B, the XOR of that is B plus. And then C is a little more complicated. I wrote out the um, sum of products canonical form here and then did some algebra. You can follow the algebra down here and we end up with C XOR A B, which is kind of interesting. And it's it's very intuitive if you think about it. If you look at this truth table, what happens is whenever both A and B are one, we flip C. That's what the XOR does. XOR is a conditional invert, remember? So what it says is take whatever C was and invert it if on the cycle one both um, A and B are one. Likewise, down here, when A and B are both a one, we take C and for the next for next C, which is C plus here, it's going to be a zero, right? And here, when both A and B are a one, the next C is going to be a one, right? Because that's the way binary counting works, right? We increment a bit here when everything below it is is um, is all ones, all right? So that kind of tells us how we can build a binary counter, and this is much simpler than an adder. Um, an incrementer. So here's A plus takes the old A and just inverts it, as we said here. For B, it's just A, B plus is just A X or B. So we take B, feed it back, A, right, gives us that one. And then for C, I need to check if everything, these two were one. We do that with an AND gate here, and then use that as the input to this XOR, which is the conditional inversion, so C plus is XOR of A and B, uh, XOR with C. So you can imagine that there's a way to generalize this with the same principle. We said we're going to flip a bit whenever everything, anything below it is a one. All right. And that's kind of what we did in this stage. I didn't really talk about it that way, but this is we're flipping B. Right, whenever A is a one. Right, here B goes from um, from zero to one, and then here B goes from one to zero, and here B goes from zero to one, etc. Okay, so we could kind of extend that idea to to bigger counters, and so uh, we can extend it to n bits. We can extrapolate the C plus idea. So if we wanted to have a D plus. That would be D XORed with the AND of A, B, and C. And if we wanted to have an E stage, that would be E XORed with A, B, C, and D. Right. So um, we get bigger and bigger AND gates here as we grew, which that means it doesn't really scale very well. Uh, one way to allarge, allow it to scale better would be to kind of do this cascaded AND. So we, we do the AND here, which has the 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 uh, well, let's look at this one. This one's going to have the and of A and and B, and then we pass it on and we and C into it and we pass it on and we add D to it and D to it. So each stage kind of gets just the the and that it needed below it, and then it that gets passed on and contributes to the and above it. Um, I added a couple extra signals here <clears throat> while I was at it. It was a CE, which is the count enable. Right, so we can easily have a count enable for a counter by having an input here to the first stage. So I made the first stage look like every other stage. But instead of getting its input from some AND gate, 
or some AND function to the left. It's just a control input. So if this is zero, all these ANDs get zeroed out and nothing ever happens. The state never changes, right? So it's a nice way to kind of control this. Thing. And then this thing at the end, this AND signal, which is the AND of everything in here, right? That's terminal count. That tells us uh, when we've reached the maximum value. We've reached the maximum value when there's a one in every flip up here, and that will make TC be true when, when that's the case. So that tells us when we've reached the maximum value. Okay. This also allows two of these kind of circuits to cascade. First, first of all, these are useful circuits, clock and or signals, a clock enable signal. You might want to turn the counter off, like I showed you in the previous example. You want it to just count once in a while. And then the terminal count is useful because it tells us when the counter is done counting up to its its desired uh, its maximum value. Right. These these two signals are also useful if we wanted to kind of view this as a building block, and then we could cascade two of these. So if I had one of the, this four bit counter here and I wanted to make an eight bit counter, I could just take another instance of this thing, plug the terminal count into the clock enable signal of the next stage, and that would give me an eight bit counter because when the terminal count is true, that's when we want to enable the upper half. Okay, so that's synchronous counters. Uh, so now you know how to, and you, uh, you know how to build counters. You could extend this to other types of counters. If you wanted to have a counter that counted down instead of counting up, you could, you could use the same procedure or a gray counter or whatever. You could just write the next state logic um, for that counter. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to say um, about this kind of cascaded solution here is that there's a long carry, there's a long delay in here. Not exactly a carry, but it's similar to a carry in a ripple adder. Uh, if we grew this to a very large size, there would be a long delay through this chain of, of AND gates. And, you know, we, we know from experience that uh, these kind of linear connects these cascaded connections lead to a delay that's proportional to n and we as always we'd like to have a delay from uh in here the combinational delay to be proportional to the log of n if we could so you could think about doing this and function with a tree now it has the same property of a carry in that we need the and all the way along the way not just at the final end so that tells us we could use something like a parallel prefix tree, similar to what we did in uh, adders, right? So we could, I didn't draw it here in, in full detail, but you could use a circuit like this to generate all these, in, they're really the internal terminal count values signals. It's the end of everything to the left at each point. So we, we could use a, this is just a parallel prefix tree similar to what we looked for, looked at when we were studying adders. And this would help um, reduce the delay and, and make the counter go fast. Okay, so I think that's it. Yeah, okay, and then I wanted to mention about odd counts. Um, so sometimes we wanna use a binary counter to count to something other than zero through its maximum value. Um, this is similar to what I showed you previously in Verilog, we could uh, use a little comparator and compare at some point and then use the result of comparison to reset the counter. So in this case, it would only count up to 11 and when it reached 11, it would reset back to zero. Or we could do something like have a loadable counter. So if those flip-flops in the counter had a multiplexer at the input of them so that we could load particular values in to start, then you could use the terminal account to load a value and, and this one would count from four up to one 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 one, which would be fifteen. Okay, so we have ways to kind of modify the counters with a little extra stuff to um, to make them count to odd counts, not necessarily a power of two counts. And lastly, I want to mention about ring counters, and this, these are really one hot counters. They take a one and they just move it through the word. Um, the kind of most straightforward way to do that would be to build a shift register as shown here. Here's four flip-flops in a shift register configuration. And then I controlled the, I set the, I, I wired the reset signal to set on the first and reset on the others. And what this means is 
when the reset is asserted on that clock cycle, a one will be put into this flip-flop and a zero into all the others. And then if once we release reset and just clock this thing, that one will just move through. And when it gets here, it'll just come back around and in. Okay, so that one will constantly move through. Uh, kind of a neat version of this is a self-starting version. Uh, and this is a neat circuit that has, again, it's a ring counter, has four flip-flops and they're wired up this way. So what will happen here is uh, this is a NOR gate. So as long as there's any one, one anywhere in here, any of these three taps, if there's a one there, or if there's multiple ones there, it'll generate a zero at this point. So what will happen is when you turn this thing on and start clocking it, there may be some ones in here and there may be some zeros in here. If there's any ones in here, what will happen is they'll keep and every every cycle as as these ones are moving through, this NAN, uh, NOR gate will generate zeros and it'll keep shoving zeros in here. Okay. Once it gets filled up with zeros all the way to this point, we've got three zeros going into the NOR, and now it'll generate a one for one clock cycle. And then that one will move through here. And as a one is moving through here, it'll keep that as a zero. And when the one gets to that stage, this NOR gate will generate it another, um, at that point it'll be all zeros here and it'll generate a new one and put it in here, right? So then it'll just keep functioning as a ring counter. Um, and the nice thing is it's a self-starting. You don't need a reset signal. You turn it on and clock it for a few clock cycles and within, guaranteed within three clock cycles, it'll be into its normal mode of operation. So just thought I'd show you that. It's kind of a tricky, neat circuit. Okay, so I think that was the conclusion of this lecture. Um, talked about counters, talked about shifters, uh, talked about constant coefficient multiplication, and talked about general variable multiplication. And if anybody wants to ask anything, I'd be happy to take a question. Otherwise, we're going to move on to new, new topics. Okay, take a drink. Okay, so this, oops. Now these notes I haven't posted yet. I'm sorry. I tried to post them before lecture and I got had an error with um, the posting. So I'm going to have to do that after the lecture. I'll make sure that you can see this. Okay. Um, let's put it in play. Okay. So this is lecture 19, and this is about um, clock and power distribution. So this is kind of a big change <laughs> from what I was just talking about, um, but this is a kind of an important topic that I wanted to cover before the semester was over. Um, and this is more about the physical realities of building real chips and has to do with special care for distributing clock signals and for power signals and the consequence of non-ideal clock signals and non-ideal power distribution. Right. So it's kind of a nasty reality. Is it something where in the real world we need to worry about some of these things? And it's it's more about implementation and less about logic design, but it's a, it's important consideration for those of you are learning how to build chips or even understanding limitations of FPGAs. Okay, so the three topics, as I mentioned, there's clock non-idealities, uh, clock distribution and power distribution. So we're gonna first review a little bit about timing, and then we'll talk about clock uh, uncertainty. Okay, so first of all, back to our usual picture of uh, synchronous timing. Uh, the thing that dictates the timing and the maximum clock period and uh, in, in our designs is uh, kind of shown here. We have some data in a register. We have another register and a combination logic block and 
on the rising edge of a clock, we this register gets some new data, and then um, during the clock period, it, the data kind of propagates through the combinational logic, and it has to be here and ready to go by the next rising edge of the clock. Because the way the circuits work is, we do a register transfer. We transfer every register to, to some other register on every clock cycle. The timing parameters that are important for the register that we've looked at before are the uh, setup time, and that says how early the data has to come before the rising edge of the clock for positive edge triggered flip flops, which is what we'll assume here. And then there's clock to queue, and that's when we change the internal state of the flip flop, how long it is until the output changes to reflect that new input. And then there's a hold time constraint, which says when we're loading a value into a flip flop, how long after the clock edge that data has to be held constant in order to reliably capture it in the flip flop. Okay, now uh, we had a simp simple um, kind of understanding of this later in the semester. We said that this clock to queue delay is just a single number. In the real world, there's probably different delays for rising and falling transitions. Um, but, uh, and we'll, we'll look at that now. We'll, uh, we'll look at things a little more carefully than we did previously. So if we do it, we, what we really have is, um, we have clock to queue max and clock to queue min. Okay, and those might, might be different because of rising versus falling. Um, it might be different. It might actually depend on what, what the data is that we're loading into the, into the flip flop. But for now, imagine that there's a range here that's not just a single number. There's a max and there's a min. Then we have the setup time, which is a single number, and then the hold time. Uh, likewise, for the combinational logic, uh, we've talked about the critical path, right? which is the slowest path, but there's also a fastest path through this logic. And that comes into play when we look at hold time violations. And the max comes into play when we're looking at the maximum clock frequency, right? Or the length of the critical path. Okay, so uh, the what we saw before was the cycle time max. So we said that in order for the circuit to work correctly, the clock period it has to be greater than the time for the clock to queue plus the logic plus the setup. But what we're really what we, we really care about is the clock to queue max plus the maximum time through the logic. That's what we called the critical path previously, plus the setup time for the register. Right. When we look at the hold time violations, this is really we call it a race margin. Uh, if we violate the hold time, which means the signal going into this flip flop changes uh, too early after the clock edge, this flip-flop may not accurately capture that data. And that can happen if there's kind of a race through this. So we have, let's say we look at the minimum clock to queue and then the minimum time through the combinational logic. If that's too short, then we will violate the whole time. Right. So it's kind of an interesting thing here. The cycle time is determined by kind of the slowest path from here to here and the race margin, we have to worry about the fastest path through here, right? So um, when hold time violations show up, the CAD tools often will try to fix that, maybe by adding more delay in here, by effectively making the logic time, uh, the, the delay through the logic, the minimum time to be longer which will then hold the signal here a little longer so it doesn't violate the whole time. Okay. So that's kind of a review of the constraints, the timing constraints that we have to live with. And so um, let's look at clock signals and see how that interacts with these constraints. So there's some non-ideal characteristics to uh, of the clock. Uh, we've been considering the clock as kind of a perfect signal, but it really isn't. There's uh, three types of um, variations that happen with the clock that can cause problems in designs. One is um, so-called clock skew. 
And that's a timing difference between the sync of a signal and the source of the signal. And by source and sync, uh, just back to this, this is the source of the signal, this is the sync. So this is, the, this is where the signal's launched <laughs> and this is where it's received. Here, we're assuming these, uh, up till now we assume that both these flip-flops here, both our registers see the clock at exactly the same, same version of the clock, right? But in a clock skew would say that there's a little difference in timing between the time that the clock signal arrives here and when the clock signal arrives here. It could arrive here a little early and a little later here, or a little earlier here and a little later here, depending on how the clock is wired up to these flip-flops. And that difference in timing can actually affect this, this constraint down here, as I'll show you in a few minutes. So that's what we call clock skew. And it can be deterministic based on the layout and the design of the, the circuits, or it could be um, sort of random due to random variations. Now, I'll, I'll show you more about that in a minute. Then there's uh, what we call clock jitter. And this is temporal variations in consecutive edges of the clock. So this means if you looked at this clock signal on an oscilloscope, you wouldn't see a very clean edge, you'd see kind of a jittering. Right? You may have experienced that when you looked at signals on the oscilloscope before. And um, there's some modulation plus random noise usually, right? Depending on the source of the jitter. Uh, so like I said, you can look at the kind of the, uh, if you looked and if you laid uh, repeated cycles of the clock on top of one another and looked at it, you wouldn't see a very, because of jitter, you wouldn't see a very clean edge. It kind of uh, move around over time kind of randomly around that that center point, right? That would be the ideal, but then jitter would kind of uh, Create some variations in timing right, From edge to edge. It's really from edge to edge But if you laid these cycles on top of one another they would they would appear to be kind of blur out the, the precise time when that edge occurs and there's like cycle to cycle jitter uh, which is um, from one cycle to the next and a short-term cycle and the uh, jitter and then there's long-term jitter. Uh, we're primarily interested in cycle-to-cycle -cycle jitter as I'll show you in a second. Um, and then there's variation on the pulse width. Okay, we think of our clock as a square signal, square wave, but in fact there may be the, the width of those, uh, of those um, uh, the pulse, you know, the squareness might vary over time. It's not so important for edge triggered designs, but if we use level level sensitive uh, clocking, like use latch, latch style designs, which we haven't actually talked about much, then it becomes important. So we're not gonna worry about variation of pulse width. It's mainly clock skew and jitter. So let me show you. So these are um, sources of clock uncertainty. These are um, kind of a list of all the things that can affect the um, clock signal and create uncertainty in it. And when I say uncertainty, it's really these, this list of, of three things here. So this is a kind of enumeration of everything that could have bad effects on the clock and make it not ideal. Right, so number one is clock generation itself. So this clock signal comes from um, usually a crystal, right? Um, but there may be some other PLL circuit, phase lock loop circuit, or some other circuit that's used to maybe count, um, divide the clock, or or multiply it up to a higher frequency. All the circuitry there could have some own, its own built-in jitter, and, and uh, right, which would affect the clock signal coming into the chip. The number two is uh, device variation. So when he, when we send the clock signal to different places on the chip. Uh, oftentimes we'll have buffers. We talked about um, kind of controlling wire delay and that sort of thing earlier. And so sometimes we use buffers to help distribute the clock. If there's variations from one buffer to the next, right, because of uh, slight layout differences or quite the small manufacturing differences that could make one of these inverters in this case uh, stronger than the other, right, which could change the clock edge a little bit or could cause a little bit of delay on one branch versus another branch of the of the clock. There's also interconnect variations, right? Uh, we said that the capacitance of the and the resistance of the interconnect, right, could be an important factor in the delay on the clock. 
right? Getting it from this point to that point and to this point. If we expect those to be equal, they may not be equal because these two wires will be, could be slightly different, different because of manufacturing variations, right? Um, there's also power supply variations. If there's noise on the power supply, meaning the power supply is not a perfect, you know, one volt and ground is not perfect zero volts. Yeah, maybe it's varying over time a little bit. That means it's gonna, that variation will be reflected because the voltage across the transistors in here will be varying. That means the current coming out here and the voltage at this point will vary over time. So the noise from the power supply can kind of leak through these devices and appear on these the outputs of them. And that's the clock signal, right? So that can create uh, variations as well. Um, that's four. Five is temperature, yes. Uh, we mentioned that the um, transistor operation is uh, uh, somewhat dependent on temperature. Um, so the, the amount of current that you get is, is uh, somewhat dependent on temperature. Okay, so that's going to have an effect. And uh, one, if one of these drivers in our clock distribution is hotter than another, it will have slightly different output current. Right? So that creates some variations. Uh, number six, a capacitive load. This is an interesting one because the clock, this branch of the clock might connect up to this flip-flop and this connects to this flip-flop, but they might have slightly different capacitance. Or it could be that this branch of the clock connects to and more flip-flops because of the local nature of the circuit. This one maybe connects to fewer flip-flops. Therefore, this is going to see more capacitance here, so there'll be more delay on that wire and less delay on that wire. Furthermore, the capacitance of the connection into the flip-flop. It connects in the flip-flops I showed you, it connects to the uh, transmission gates. Uh, that capacitance is actually a function of the data that's inside the flip-flop. So it's, it's a pretty complicated uh, story. Um, and then there's capacitive coupling to adjacent lines. So if you have this wire here, which is a clock wire, there's another wire over here. Uh, there's capacitance between those wires. So the voltage on this wire is going to affect the voltage on that wire. So if this is toggling up and down, that could have an effect on the uh, voltage on the uh, clock signal here. And it may be different on different clock wires. So that you might see a variation from one clock wire to the next. Okay, so I think that's that's all of it. That creates all these um, ways that the clock signal can, can vary over time and be non-ideal. So we try to deal with these the best we can. One way to deal with it. Okay, so, um, oh, all right, we'll talk about later how to deal with it. I wanna talk a little bit more about the effect, what this does to our timing. So uh, here's the, the, the um, kind of the situation that we end up seeing then. If we look at two versions of the clock, this is at one register and this is at some other register at some other point in the, on the chip. And we expect those to be, these clock signals to be exactly the same, but they're not because of the variations that I mentioned on the last slide. So first of all, we're gonna see some skew here. We'll call that T uh, sub J S. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's sorry. That's, that's the jitter, the skew is here, T sub S K. That's the difference. We're going to measure it here from the kind of halfway point, the rise time of this clock edge, or the rising edge of that clock to the rising edge of that other clock signal. They're supposed to be the same, but there's some difference here. So that's what we call the skew. Right? And then there's um, some jitter here, and this is kind of the spread of the, the edge. It won't, every time it won't be exactly at that point. It'll kind of vary over time here and it kind of varies from edge to edge. So both the skew and the jitter are gonna affect the effective cycle time and the race margin, right? So you can see why it's going to affect them if you look at uh, timing of a kind of a canonical circuit here. So we have, here we have R1 goes into R2 through this combinational logic block. Let's say there's some delay here in the clock distribution for some reason or another. Let's say there's a, a buffer here or something else that causes some delay. So what we would see is the clock going into R1 is the signal here, right? The clock going into R2 is the signal down here at the bottom, it's clock sub two. And what's important here, what for 
analyzing the timing here. So the launching edge is this, it's the rising edge of clock one because that's when the data will be put into this register here. And then it starts propagating through the combinational logic and it needs to be ready and set up for the rising edge of clock two because that's the receiving edge. So what we'll see here is the data transmission starts here at one and it's, it doesn't have to be ready until this edge four. So what happens is the effective clock period that we have in order to get the signal from this register, this register is now increased by the amount of uh, some delta. And the delta is the, we're calling the clock skew in this case, it's the difference in time between these two clocks. So it looks like we've actually effectively lengthened out the clock period in this case. Right. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, so sometimes skew can help actually. It, it allowed us more time to get a signal through here. So we could put a more complicated circuit in here or we could you know, clock everything faster and still have it work correctly. Right. But there's this the <laughs> negative skew. That was positive skew. Negative skew actually hurts us because now the launching clock edge is here and the receiving clock edge is here. So we've shortened the clock period by the amount of the skew, right? That's if, so you hear I'm having the delay go the other way so that um, it's a negative skew. Right, you see that? So the data gets launched here because that, that's the clock for that flip-flop and it propagates through and we need to get it set up and ready for this edge, which is the rising edge of the next clock. Um, uh, the next clock cycle, but it's this uh, clock two. And so the period here gets shorter. So that adds an extra constraint here. So uh, what this means then is, um, <clears throat> if we can express it this way, we can say the minimum cycle time then is the clock period plus the skew, right? And um, that has to be, greater than or equal to the sum of the clock to queue time plus the setup plus, plus the logic delay max. And in this equation, the skew can be negative or positive. So if it's positive, it helps. So these, the sum can be greater. Uh, if it's negative, it hurts, meaning this sum has to be less. So when we're designing our circuits, we kind of have to know what the worst case clock skew will be and um, accommodate that. Right. We need a little extra margin in the clock frequency. We can't go as high as that we thought we could because the clock skew is going to eat into the clock period a little bit in these negative skew cases, which are going to appear. I mean, some of the paths will have positive skew and some will have negative. Like you can't have them all have positive. Um, and then as far as the hold time violation, well, the skew can also affect that similarly. So now we say that the uh, clock to Q min plus the, the time of the logic min has to be greater than the, um, the hold time plus the delta of the clock skew. And again, a skew can help or hurt. Okay, now jitter also contributes to the critical path because um, remember what jitter is, is a variation from when the clock edge appears relative to when it's supposed to appear. Um, between, it can be between successive uh, cycles of the clock, right? So what we would see then is there's a little jitter on clock one here and there's a little jitter on, on clock two here. So there could be a jitter from the launching edge to the, uh, to the receiving edge. So we have to consider the la latest, uh, the last, point in the jitter profile where this edge could be for the launching and then consider the earliest uh, where the edge could be in the in the kind of receiving clock uh, profile here. So then the, we consider that uh, kind of have to subtract off the, the jitter in order to get a, a better a realistic um, uh, constraint on uh, the clock period. Okay. So you can see then we, we have two 
instances of the clock jitter that, that come in here, this uh, JS1 and JS2. And so here it is. Um, I think this is the whole thing. Yes. Okay. So the clock period minus the jitter um, at one minus the jitter at two plus the skew has to be greater than the sum of these three in order for the circuit to function correctly. Right. And so down here, I just move the jitter over to the other side. They're, we can call them the same. So it's two times the jitter and uh, there's minus sign in front of the delta, move it to the other side. So the clock period has to be greater than what we had previously. So the clock to Q plus the logic delay plus the setup and now minus the skew, clock skew delta plus two times the nominal clock jitter. And these are kind of measurable or estimated. These, these are, once we know the layout of the chip, uh, these can be estimated and sometimes they, they can even be measured, but usually they're estimated by the tools based on the technology and, and the way that it does the layout and some other assumptions. So again, skew can be either positive or negative. Um, and then we have to also consider the jitter. The jitter is usually expressed as peak-to-peak uh, -peak or some RMS value. Okay, I wanna just say one last thing on clock skew. Um, I said that uh, positive skew can help and negative skew can hurt, but uh, some designers have actually used this to their advantage. So if you have kind of a pipeline design like this, with um, some feed, and usually have some feedback. So if all the signals are moving in one direction, you can distribute the clock in the same direction as the uh, signals are moving, and that will create a positive skew. So what will happen, the clock gets here at this point in time, and it gets here at a little later point in time, which will leaves, leaves a little more time for the signals to make it through the combinational logic here. That was the positive skew case, right? So we could take advantage of that by either putting more logic here or by actually clocking the circuit faster than it would otherwise, because you take advantage of the uh, positive skew here. Okay, but then at this feedback stage, right, because the clock is distributed in this way, we're gonna have a negative skew from this register through that logic back to this register. So if we did increase the clock frequency, we might, these stages might work correctly, but this stage might fail because there's not enough time to get the signal back into that register. Uh, but what designers could do, could do in that case is to put less logic in here. So kind of decrease the critical path by a lot of this stage, right? So you have a lot of stages here that you know, have this positive skew and then this negative skew case stage, maybe you just put a small model logic here and then that would allow it to function correctly, right? So this has been used on various computers over the years um, on uh, kind of data path designs within the processors. It's um, not done so much these days because it's, it's pretty hard to get this to work out in complicated designs. It only works in special cases. Okay, so that was all about clock skew and um, how it can affect the uh, kind of maximum clock frequency and the constraint regarding um, hold times. So I wanna talk now a little bit, probably be the last topic today about how we can actually um, achieve good clock distributions um, in the Clock distribution is a way that we can guarantee that the clock is close to ideal, as close as possible. Let's go back to the, oops, I opened my share. I lost my. <laughs> I lost my thing. Okay, here it is. Oh, this one's gone. Okay, I hope you can see this one again. Okay, clock distribution. Um, I'm stuck. This happens sometimes. I have to start this up again.
That's the wrong one. This one. All right. Okay, so here we are. All right, so clock distribution. So this part is um, how do we, when we design ASICs or even FPGAs, uh, when those get designed, how, how do we distribute the clock so it's as close to ideal as possible? All right, um, so generally there's, quite often there's a single clock that's used to synchronize all the logic on the same chip or at least a region of the chip these days. So we need to find a way to distribute the clock over the entire region. And we want to do this and maintain low skew and jitter. And, and also we like to do it without burning too much power. Right? So how do we do this? So one idea and what we used to do in the old days is we would just connect the clock signal like any other signal in the chip. We just kind of route it where it needs to go. So here's PLL, that's the phase lock loop that's used for generating the clock. And then we just kind of wire it up to all the flip-flops, right? It just needs to go to all the state elements, flip-flops and memory blocks, anything that uses the clock. And we could just wire it up or, you know, in some random way, whatever is most convenient. Okay, but this wouldn't be a good way to do it because we would end up probably with a different delay from this central point of distribution to all these flip-flops here, right? We'd end up with a lot of skew. And that would be bad because that would cut into our cycle time. So we'd like to get the skew to be as short as possible. So how do we do that? Well, we do it with very regular structures that have predictable delay in them. Right? And the most common one is an H tree. And an H tree is this fractal self-similar pattern. You can see it in a lar large scale here on the left. So so you have a clock signal here, and we may have a, an inverter which kind of uh, buffers up the signal. We send it out here, and then it goes to these four, right? And that sends it to those, and that splits and goes to those guys. And these may be the flip-flops at the end, right? So this would be a tree that's not very deep. Um, H trees, it's kind of an, a known way to lay out a, a tree in two dimensions. And the nice thing about the tree is the distance from this, just the root here, the distribution point to every leaf, it everyone takes the same kind of path, right? So there, every path is the same. So you're going to have the same skew from the central point to all the um, flip flops on the end. Now it won't be perfect because these, in this case, these buffers are going to be a little bit different. To, from one another due to temperature or processing variations and the wires will be a little different because of variations and crosstalk and everything else but it's a lot better than what was on the previous slide which kind of just a random wiring right so this this helps a lot um, and then you could see a h tree here for a larger <laughs> version of it right and you'd have to use more layers if you had you know more bigger chip so it's kind of a nice way to do it. And so it's kind of a standard way to do a, this, this kind of clock distribution. And um, more, this is, by the way, FPGAs do something very similar to this because in an FPGA, because of the regularity of its layout, you know, the, the LUTs, uh, the, the combinational logic blocks all appear in a nice array. So the, the location of the flip-flops on the chip all appear in a predictable regular pattern. Therefore, you could build uh, this kind of H tree clock distribution or something very similar to it. Um, what happens on a real ASIC is that the placement of the flip flops is not guaranteed to be guaranteed to be at the endpoints of this tree. They're kind of randomly distributed around depending on what the circuit is. Right. So it's hard to get it achieve a ideal H tree in ASIC. So you get something that kind of looks more like this. It's kind of tree-like, right? Where you have this branching and you try to keep everything as balanced as possible. But, you know, these load points, the, the ends of the tree here, you can see they're kind of randomly distributed because the flip-flops would be randomly distributed at different places on the chip. So this is kind of more realistic um, 
version. I should have clipped this off, but it's more of a realistic version of what an H tree would look like on an ASIC. Right. So the the CAD tools that do the help you do the layout um, have routines in them that go, can do tree layouts that they can do clock layouts that are very similar to this. Um, the alternative to an H tree would be something like a grid. And this was this has been used quite a bit in ASIC design where you have you can see um, just the horizontal and vertical wires that just kind of form this thing that looks like a screen or a grid. And then uh, the flip-flops would all be somewhere in the interior here and it just kind of tap off the the grid where it's needed to, to get a connection to, um, to the clock. And the idea here is that um, there's kind of this, in, in this case, we're, we're driving it, you drive it from all four sides, right? So you can see that the kind of electrical distance from a driver to any node in here would be very similar for, um, for all of these uh, internal spots because um, there's many different paths <laughs> to get to uh, each point in here. So there's relatively low resistance between the drivers and the clock notes. So they all electrically would have a very similar delay. Uh, the problem is this is low resistance from a driver to every point in here, which minimizes the uh, the delay. But there's actually a um, big capacitance on this because there's lots of wires involved here, right? So it uses lots of power. So it used to be used, it's uh, less favored these days. I'm going to show you a couple of examples from the past when um, it was important to try to, uh, this was when chips started going much faster. Uh, this is the DEC Alpha 21164, was designed in 95. This one had a clock period of 3.3 .3 nanoseconds. Uh, you can see the waveform here, a rise time of 350 picoseconds. Um, this thing is a kind of grid type clock layout that I showed you previously. It had a pre-driver. And remember, part of the issue with clock driving is you're driving a large capacitive load, as we talked about earlier in the semester, and therefore you need multiple stages of drivers, right? So it had a smaller drivers here driving this pre-driver, which drove these final drivers here. Um, just to give you an idea of how much capacitance, if you looked at the, in this chip, which is a big microprocessor chip, had 3.75 nanofarads total of clock load. That's the total capacitance of all of the places that the clock has to connect. And um, this clock distribution used 20 watts itself just to drive the clock around the chip. These final drivers, in order to make them high enough current to get this 350 picosecond rise time, right? It, they had to have very low resistance, right? Because you have this big capacitance here, you need really low resistance to get this to 350 picoseconds. So I don't remember the resistance, but the total width of the transistors in these drivers was 58 centimeters, which is very large. Right? So this is fairly effective. Here you can see these big clock driver transistors that are here and they're spread across, kind of distributed here. So there's, uh, then the kind of gets tapped off where it's needed. Well, the clock signals are tapped off where needed to feed kind of a grid structure. This was a kind of interesting visualization that they did when they designed the chip to look at the uh, clock skew. So here's the chip X dimension of the chip, Y dimension of the chip. So we're kind of looking down on the chip and then looking at the clock uh, distribution network, which is kind of a grid thing. And where higher up on this graph means more skew. And you could see they got everything to be within about, I don't know, eight or 10 picoseconds of skew, right? From one place on the chip to another, right? That's the kind of variation in terrain here. The zero skew is down here, and these are where the clock drivers are, right? And then as you move out away from the clock drivers, you get more skew due to the delay along the wires. Some of it's kind of speed of light type delay, and some due to resistance and capacitance and other variations. At this corner of the chip is the worst case skew. But so once they did this simulation, they understood um, what 
the maximum skew is going to be so they could figure out as part of the simulation what the maximum clock frequency would be. Um, Okay, so that's a, that's a nice visualization of clock skew. Uh, here is a, a later version that kind of improved this. This is the 21264. Uh, this is a 600 megahertz design, uh, 0.35 micron, which is what, 350 nanometers. Um, this had a 2.8 nanofarad clock load and 40 centimeters of final driver width. Uh, again, the same rise time, 350 picoseconds, but the cycle time was less. And in order to get this, they had a configuration that kind of is shown over here on the left. We've got us some uh, pre-drivers of PLL, that's a phase lock loop, that's the source of the clock. Multiple stages of pre-drivers out to these, these distributed pre-drivers and then these final pre-drivers that are here, or final drivers that are here in red. And then they drove the signals in towards each segment of the chip here. And I think, uh, yeah, this just shows it was a little more details of that. And this is not a 3D version, but it's a 2D version of the clock skew. Remember, the clock, the clock was distributed to these four sections of the chip. And here's uh, 50 picoseconds of skew in the red. And the blue, or this purple, is you know, very low, less than five picoseconds. And that's where... Um, Kind of how you can see how the skew increases as you move further and further away from the uh, from the clock drivers, and then here is um, uh, the rise time plots. So you can see they achieved their goal of 350 picosecond rise time. This is another way to visualize clock skew, which is this kind of a nice picture. This is IVM power uh, CPU, where what this is is a another kind of 3D plot where you see in the y-axis is delay and here's the root of the clock distribution tree down here and then this is the first level of buffers the second level of buffers more buffers here so you can see the as the signal moves to a buffer it, it, it's delayed and then there's more delay associated with the buffer and then more delay associated with that buffer and then it gets distributed to every point where it's needed eventually it's splitting you can see the clock distribution tree splitting and then it gets to the leaves that is the top here and that's the kind of grid of, of flip-flops here and you can see that the top at the top it's pretty flat so there's relatively small variation on the surface of this which says that um, the clock cues is pretty well uh, controlled and you can see that in more detail here. We're using different color to denote different amounts of delay. And then if you looked at it kind of on a uh, plotting, um, all these flip-flop points are sinks for the clock. And look at the clock signal plotted at all those points on top of one another. The kind of variation here from one to the next would be the skew and you can achieve, you, in this case they achieved a 20 picosecond skew for the clock. Right. And this is just a nice way to visualize the clock skew. Okay, so I think I'm gonna end with that. That's, um, uh, in this lecture we talked about the um, uh, clock skew and clock jitter and how that has an effect on the maximum clock frequency and also on the hold, um, the race margin as we call it. And then uh, just talk now about how we achieve a good clock distribution um, on the chips. So next time we're going to talk about power distribution. So I'll see you on, um, on Thursday. Unless anybody wants to ask anything. Probably not. Okay. So have a good couple of days and I'll see you on Thursday then. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.